Kuhn and I serve as the Bishop of the Southeastern Synod and we are so glad you are here with us uh, tonight all over our four states of Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Alabama. This is the second uh, iteration of these types of calls. Uh, we did two of these about a month ago and uh, they were well received so we decided to do uh, another two of these. Uh, like I said last week we did a version of this and had about 90 people on the call uh, with us. I'd like to uh, start by having our staff uh, welcome uh, you and introduce themselves to you and tell you uh, what position they serve on our Synod staff. So we'll start with uh, Pastor Michael Jeanette. Hi, my name is Michael Jeanette, pastor and assistant to the bishop for formation and communication. So I work directly with the ministries related to youth and young adult ministries. Thank you. Pastor Karen Boda. I'm Pastor Karen Boda, and I'm assistant to the Bishop for Congregational Life, and I work primarily in the space of uh, mobility, so congregations and pastors who are in transition, fostered ministers in transition. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Jill Henning. I'm Pastor Jill Henning. I'm the assistant to the Bishop for Leadership and Administration. And Melissa Fuller-Sims, are you with us tonight? Can you unmute yourself and introduce? Hi, I'm Melissa Fuller Sims. I'm assistant to the bishop, also director of the Evangelical Mission, one of the directors, as well as coordinator for candidacy. Thank you. And I'm scrolling through my screen. Did I get all of our staff? I think I may have. Um, later in the call, you'll be introduced to uh, Pastor Jonathan Trapp, who uh, is serving on our COVID-19 uh, task force. But we want to first open up with a word of prayer and devotion. Um, and Miss Sims will do that for us. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. with you. Mighty God, thank you that you hear and answer our prayers. Thank you that you are perfectly faithful. You never forget, <laughs> never fail, and never take back a promise. You have promised that when your people gather in your name, your presence is here with us. Hear our prayer and be in the midst of our conversation today. Thank you that your presence calms the troubled sea of life and speaks peace to our souls. Fix our eyes on you and let our ears be attentive to your voice. Give us clear minds and peaceful hearts as we gather together. According to your abundant mercy, you have caused us to be born again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. May we live in the light of your salvation, experiencing the freedom that is ours in you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen, thank you so much. It uh, looks like we have the chat working now, so uh, what I'm gonna ask you to do is to participate in that in just a second. Just as a couple of Zoom reminders for those of you who haven't become Zoom pros like some of us, um, at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, um, there's a little microphone, and we're going to encourage you to keep that muted until uh, time for questions and answers later. There's also a start video, stop video. Uh, throughout the uh, time tonight, Pastor Michael Jeanette can offer any help to you um, via technology questions, and all you have to do is go to the chat box on the bottom of your screen that has a little bubble like this that says chat and go to his name and uh, he will um, offer any tech help he can. <clears throat> um, again, there will be time in the chat box in just a second, I'm gonna ask you to participate in something and then later for the Q&A. I don't appear to, to make any uh, guesses on how old anyone is on this call, but my uh, supposition is none of you on this Zoom were alive between 1917 and 1919. If I'm wrong, unmute yourself and tell us because we sure would like to, to greet you. You may win the award for our oldest member here tonight. But because of that, that means that we are now living in a space and a time uh, that our generation, at least those of us who are living and breathing and being church for the sake of the world today, have never had to live through. And that's a global pandemic. The last time that happened was over a hundred years ago. In doing research over the past couple of months, it's been interesting for me to see how churches in 1917 and 18, and even post-pandemic all the way to 1922, 
handled what is known as the Spanish flu or the influenza of 1918. It transformed the United States in ways that were unimaginable in that time and left an indelible mark on the people who lived in that space and in that time. I believe what we're living through now, COVID-19, will indeed and has done the same to us. We will never be the same people. We will never be the same church. But I don't believe that that means that we are people without hope. And I certainly don't believe that good does not come out of what might seem life altering. Now to be sure, we have certainly received our well full share of losses in the midst of this pandemic. Losses which for some of us range from very large to very small, some that don't even have a size that you can equate to them because they're just too painful. There are some losses that many may seem are first world problems or maybe first world privileges. The reality is we live in a first world and it's a loss and we have to be attentive to that loss. Over these past couple of months, we're now in week nine of, at least for me, sheltering in place, rounding into week 10. And I have heard losses that range in these ways, and maybe you have too, maybe you've experienced them. The lack of a child who doesn't get to go to prom, or graduations that were supposed to happen that people looked forward to, whether it was high school, or college, or seminary, or medical school. Or maybe it's the elderly parent who you can't visit, physically hold and touch and hug in the nursing home. Or maybe it's the members who have died in your own congregation or in your own homes, or maybe even in your own families that you're not able to be with physically as their death draws near, or even to mourn them respectfully with a large funeral. Or maybe it's the small losses that go unforeseen and even unforgotten. Like the loss of the family meal that you look forward to or the Mother's Day outing or the hike or the song. Whatever those may be, I still believe there's good that can come from this and I've seen it. I've had our staff read a book in the past uh, two, two months now called How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going, Leading in a Liminal Season. I don't know about you, but I have felt more appropriately given to that book than not in the past couple of months as the Bishop of the Synod, leading in the midst of a global pandemic. I've never been a bishop before, at least not since 10 months ago, and I've never had to lead in the midst of a global pandemic. And you've never had to be congregational members and pastors and deacons and synod staff who have had to do that as well. In this book, it says this, Liminal seasons are thin spaces where the presence of the divine is palpable. Liminal seasons are ripe opportunities of faith to deepen their practices of group discernment, to watch for the movement of God. I'd like for you, as I'm talking here for a little while, I'd like for you in the chat box, I'd like for you to write those spaces that you have seen the presence of God at work even in the midst of this global pandemic? What are those things or people or spaces or events that you actually give God thanks for because of this? Maybe it's time to slow down or be with family. Maybe it's the opportunity to be with people you've not had an actual telephone conversation with in years. Whatever it may be, I encourage you now to go to the chat box and where it says everyone Write those responses of where you've been invited into those movements of God in this time and space. I've seen that in our synod. I've seen that in you. I've seen that in congregations who have worked tirelessly over these weeks and months. None of your pastors went to seminary to be trained as communications majors. None of them learned how to become televangelists. And yet we're doing it. And yet you're doing it by supporting folks, your musicians, your church administrators, your councils. Everyone's diving in and helping to make sure the gospel comes alive and well. We know that these can be and still are unforeseen times. And so what we hope to do is tonight offer some guidance for you as you look at what it means to be church both separately as you socially distance, but also with hope of physically gathering. 
we know that the church has never been closed. We've always been open. And I think ever more so now, the body of Christ has shown the world that church looks like way more than brick and mortar and big steeples and organs that are booming, but the ever-breathing people of God who are willing to love their neighbor enough not to conflict with their neighbor in person. So we've been in the Synod here. We've had multiple uh, events over these past three months. This is our second round of these calls. I've done two rounds of calls with our deanery groups, which is where pastors and deacons are in geographic regions around our, our synod, which is 15 of those. We've had two opportunities of rounds of those for Zooms. Uh, met with all of, uh, or not all, but we've had five opportunities of youth Zooms with our uh, synod. The Mental Health Task Force has been hard at work on providing resources for you. And tonight you'll also hear about some grant opportunities that have been given uh, to those places and spaces around our synod. So I'd like to, at this time, invite uh, Pastor Jill Henning, who has been co-convening the Synod's COVID-19 Task Force, uh, to introduce you to uh, one of the leads on that task force. I call this group together at the beginning of uh, this pandemic, and on this group, uh, it includes Pastor Jonathan Trapp, who you'll meet in just a minute, uh, Dr. Erica Bjornstad, who is an epidemiologist, Dr. Winton King, who's a retired medical doctor from Atlanta, Pastor Tom Clark, who's on our disaster response team for the Synod and serves in Jackson, Mississippi, Mr. Imran Siddiqui, who's the vice president of the Synod, Pastor Jill Henning, my assistant, and myself as your bishop. All of those resources we put out, the multitudes of letters and videos can all be found at the COVID-19 response on the Synod website. What they will go through is a small portion of the COVID-19 over 20 page document we put together to help you in your phasing approach. Some have cautioned that I should urge you uh, not to go back to church and when an exact date you should go back for. I did do that for the month of May. I can't do that going forward and here's why. Because we are four states in one synod which every county in those four states is completely different when it comes to the number of people who are infected with this disease. Each church has to do what's best for your congregation. What I will highly encourage you though, is know your context, which you know better than I do. Know your building, know what your capabilities are, know your age range and vulnerabilities of those people who may show up and put no one at risk at least at little to limited of risk. Because the reality is, at least for the next couple of years, there will remain a risk regardless of how careful we are. I know we're yearning to get back with one another. I miss singing in the assembly because singing in front of my computer screen is just not the same. I miss dining at the table with each of you. I miss that hug and that handshake. I miss seeing those faces that we look forward to seeing each and every week but I don't miss it enough to put anyone in harm's way. I don't miss it enough to make it to where anyone would risk their lives or be at a health risk. And so because of that, we're trying to put forth the best guidance we can for you as a synod and a church. So Pastor Henning, thank you for your uh, time with the COVID-19 Task Force. And if you would um, share with our group here tonight uh, who Pastor Jonathan Trapp is, but also uh, some things that you all have been working on as part of that, part of that task force. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we are um, uh, thankful to have such a dedicated group of volunteers that have helped us um, to develop resources uh, on behalf of uh, the Synod Office to guide you uh, in your congregational life. Uh, we've done um, uh, several videos. Dr. Erica Bernstead, who's the epidemiologist, uh, at the beginning of this crisis um, helped us by kind of explaining what the COVID-19 crisis was about and some of the medical risks that were. Uh, and there are videos that are available on the Southeastern Center website that you can go and look at. They're still, the, even though the date of those are um, a month or so old at this point, uh, there's still important videos to look at to get some idea about what this um, virus is like and, and why it's so important. Um, to have uh, the guidelines that we're recommending. Um, we are thrilled to have um, 
uh, some great resources of people on that task force. One of them is uh, Pastor Jonathan Trapp. He serves as the pastor for faith formation at the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer here in Atlanta, but also he works uh, full-time at the CDC and is a special advisor for emergency management. Um, on the Synod's oh. website uh, that Pastor Michael Jenez put on the chat box, there's also a video uh, that it kind of goes into what Pastor Jonathan is going to talk about in just a minute, a little more in depth, um, that uh, is kind of a training that you can take back to your congregation for uh, folks um, who are maybe on your COVID task force uh, in your congregation to help understand that 20-page document that is um, on the Synod website that's there. Uh, the ways in which you can help us uh, continue to communicate with you about changes in this virus because I've learned anything in the last um, uh, two, two months is that uh, we are constantly getting new information as scientists uh, find out new recommendations and uh, new guidelines. And so our COVID task force uh, will continue to meet and um, update resources as we have updated uh, science and um, information. And what we are asking every, every congregation to do is to form a COVID-19 task force to go through the guidelines that are provided that Pastor Jonathan Trapp is going to help us to understand in just a moment. Um, and that one of those people on that task force agree to be the disaster coordinator for your congregation. We will train that person, help them to understand not only uh, how to uh, respond to the COVID-19 task force, but help them to understand a little bit about what it means um, for a congregation to develop a disaster plan um, to deal with situations like this COVID-19 task force. So in the future, um, you will already hopefully have uh, things in place to deal with um, if there's a a tornado or a hurricane or a flood situation um, and unfortunately many parts of our synod on a weekly basis seem to have one of those types of events happening so we'd like to prepare you not only for phasing back into physical worship and physical ministries but help you to understand how you can um, equip your congregation to prepare for a disaster as well so uh, we're asking every congregation to um, to find one person and appoint that person um, so Pastor Jonathan, thank you for your time tonight and for uh, your leadership on our COVID-19 task force and for the work that you do for our country and the world at the CDC. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so first I would like to just thank, um, thank you Bishop, thank you Pastor Henning, Pastor Jeanette for uh, allowing me to be part of this meeting and to be part of the task force. I am going to share my screen which apparently I can't share my screen, so I'll not share my screen. Um, Pastor Jeanette, I think you have a copy of the slides. If I can, we're good. Okay, got the thumbs up. There we go. Okay. Just I know that a lot of folks are more visual learners, so having something to help speak through um, <clears throat> can can be useful. So as a, a a quick overview. Um, again, the Synod has put together a guide to help your congregation make decisions about how and when to uh, to return to in-person worship. And though, so to that end, it's uh, we suggest a phased approach to returning, um, <clears throat> and it also helps identify some of the benchmarks to help you determine when to move between the three different phases that are described. Um, and then additionally, within each phase, there are both suggestions for individuals and suggestions for congregations. Again, um, to, to reemphasize, the overall purpose is not to tell any congregation what to do, but to help provide you with some good comprehensive guidance for you as you make decisions that are, that are right for you and that are right for your context. Um, as the bishop said, with our synod representing four states <clears throat> and having differing guidance from state and local governments and with the different sizes of our congregations, not to mention how our physical spaces may enable or limit the implementation of some practices, it, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to try and tell everyone to do the exact same thing. So please keep in mind that this is a guide. <clears throat> Um, I want to mention that there are five core actions that should be practiced in all phases. And as as hi, CJ. Um, and as leaders, it's uh, it's it's important that that was my seven year old. Um, 
who has decided that now is the time to take up resistance band training. So, um, <laughs> so I do want to mention that um, our five core actions that should be practiced within all phases. Uh, as, as leaders, I think that it's really important that, that we model good behavior and that we let these practices form the, the basis for what we do in, in each phase. So, I mean, social distancing uh, will continue to be very important. And, and we should continue to model social distancing amongst our congregants and amongst our worship leaders through all of these phases. Uh, we believe that you should wear cloth face coverings. And it's important to emphasize that we do this out of love for our neighbor, so that if we happen to be sick but are asymptomatic, we're lessening the probability that we, are, that we could infect others. And, and modeling this and then encouraging your, your members to wear them becomes very important. Good hand washing practices should, should always be encouraged and, and making the washing of hands or the using of hand sanitizer visible during worship is always important. And in addition to just good hand washing in general, which just helps you stay safe and helps, uh, help pres help helps prevent passing along uh, not just COVID-19, but other diseases as well. And then likewise, good, consistent cleaning of surfaces is fundamental to helping prevent um, incidents of disease. And I know that even though the CDC has walked back some of their understanding of how this can transmit on surfaces, all of the recommendations that they have still recommend good, solid cleaning and disinfecting before reopening any facilities that, that have been closed. And then finally, this is always, again, always, always a good practice. If you're sick, stay home. If you know that you've been exposed to somebody who has tested positive, please stay home. And again, these, these actions, should be followed during during all of these phases. And let me let me also say that you should really um, continue to offer online worship services and and um, any of the 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 I don't want to say virtual I don't like that word but any of the the online or um, telephonic ministries that that you've been doing um, you're going to have some folks in your congregation who aren't ready to come back yet for, for a variety of reasons. And that's, and that's okay, but we want to be thinking about how do we continue to reach out to them and to make sure that they are included um, in the community. Talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> the highlights of some of these phases. And <clears throat> Pastor, as Pastor Joel, Pastor, Pastor Henning mentioned, there's a, a video that is, is out that will go through these more in depth. But moving into phase one, phase one looks basically like what we're doing right now. Um, your gatherings are still online. We're still recommending uh, maximum telework. Um, all of our synod gatherings are going, our, our in-person gatherings are going to remain canceled during this phase. In phase two, again, we always recommend that you continue those core actions. Um, and we would suggest limiting any gathering to less than 50 people, ass assuming that you can gather that many people and man maintain proper social distancing. Um, at this time, you might start to see some congregations come back together, but the service may look a little different. Um, again, how it looks will be a little different uh, for each congregation based on your content text, but the guide walks through the different things that you need to think through before you can move to phase two. And I think there are two and a half pages of bullet points to think about before you <clears throat> should feel comfortable, or at least have answers to before you move into to phase two. And, and let me just emphasize that you might find that in phase two, you can't begin returning to in-person worship. And, and again, that's okay. <clears throat> um, again, in phase three, we want you to continue all of those core actions. Um, our recommended gathering size increases to 100 individuals, again, assuming that you can maintain that, <clears throat> maintain those social distancing guidelines. And the, the guide provides um, some, good some good things to consider as you begin to reopen or expand your worship during phase three. I do want to talk a little bit about best 
practices. Um, as Pastor Henning mentioned, we, we want uh, <clears throat> everyone to, to be developing a COVID-19 task force. Um, <clears throat> and, and actually, let me, say, let me say one thing. I, I don't actually necessarily think that we are in, um, in phase one right now. I don't think that we've gotten to that point yet. So, <clears throat> and that's just based on the, the data that, that we're seeing. But we are recommending that you develop that task force to help you walk through um, how, how all of this is gonna work. I, I could see the task force including members of your staff, if you have medical professionals or public health professionals, um, they can be helpful in, in making decisions. But the way we see it is for, for pastors and for leaders, having a task force means that, that you aren't having to make all of the decisions on your own, but that you're involving, you're involving people who can help think through the issues that are raised in the guide, and that can, they can help you come up with solutions that are workable for your congregation. <clears throat> and um, again, you do want to be thinking about who your disaster coordinator would be. Second, I want to note that CDC has extensive guides for cleaning and disinfecting your worship building, and following those will be key. Um, and I mentioned that because you don't have to make it up. There've, there's been a lot of good scientific thought put into how to prepare your building <clears throat> for reopening and then how to maintain a clean building. I do think that one of the, the most challenging things for us is the fact that singing is being discouraged because of the increased ability that it has to spread the disease. And this, this doesn't mean that you can't have music. This, this doesn't mean that you can't have singing. The, the bishop has suggested that, um, instead that using a cantor who can sing on behalf of the congregation is, is just one of many ways that music can still be a lively part of, of what we do. Um, but it just means that we're going to have to rethink how we do music in our worship settings. <clears throat> and then finally, communicate with your people through all of this. And in crisis communications, um, the, the motto that we use is be first, be right, and be credible. So talking to your people throughout all of this is crucial. And Pastor Jeanette's going to be saying a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, I'm sure y'all have a lot of questions. And as the bishop mentioned, there is dedicated time at the end of this. So I will turn it back over to you, Your Grace. Thank you, uh, Pastor Trapp. Uh, a couple of notes and uh, before we move on to communications. Uh, Pastor Trapp and I serve on a national ecumenical task force uh, that's made up of over six different denominations. Um, and those uh, theologians, liturgists, medical doctors, uh, musicians uh, have been, uh, pastors, bishops, have been meeting for probably the past five, six weeks now and coming up with uh, some guidelines that are specific to sacraments and worship. They hope to have that out uh, as of June 8th. Uh, we will make sure that we put that on the COVID-19 uh, resource page for the Synod. Um, again, it has to be contextualized, remember, because this is for six or seven different denominations, and they're speaking about the, the big umbrella, which has to be brought down to uh, what works for each congregation. So, um, keep that in mind. Pastor Trapp and Pastor Henning just did a resource video, uh, which are on our, our uh, website. So I want to draw your attention to that. It's also on our social media page. Um, so please pay attention to that. The COVID-19 task force will be meeting again next week, and we're going to keep meeting throughout um, as this continues. Um, another letter, most likely, and even a, a video from either myself or the task force will go out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in there, there will be more specifics about uh, worship practices. This guidance comes from the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, the American Guild of Organists, the HIM Society of the United States, uh, and like I said, epidemiologists and leading doctors in this field. Um, what I will say quickly about uh, the music piece that was brought up, uh, there is a varying degree of scientific study on singing. It's not just singing, it's also speaking. It's also playing uh, woodwind instruments, or it, for that matter, any instrument that requires uh, an, a breath to, to blow through it. Um, what this means is we have to be mindful and careful. 
It doesn't mean eliminating altogether, but it does mean that we have to be thoughtful about how we do it. We may take note of our Jewish siblings who taught us how to sing as Christians, which is why the word cantor is still part of our vocabulary. One person would sing on behalf of the assembly. Um, and so there are that ways. Uh, there are other ways of, of doing this as well. Uh, it might mean for the short period of time that assemblies as a whole don't sing. Uh, but we know that, that uh, as it's been said, that when we all cannot sing, when one sings on our behalf, uh, God hears our prayer. Um, part of the other things that we can walk through in just a bit are uh, communion. Some questions have come up about that. Um, I'll talk about that in, in just a little bit uh, later. Um, the main thing is, is to please read through these guidelines. We don't have the time tonight to walk through every single one of these pages. The other thing that to point out, uh, the ELCA put together about a nine page document that we included in our CDC, I mean, uh, excuse me, our Synod COVID guidelines. Um, those are more broad and then ours are more specific to the four states. And then you have to make it more specific to your uh, congregation. Um, and again, I, I agree with Pastor Trapp that I do not think that we're, uh, even as a synod, in phase one. Uh, I think some places would like to think that they are. There have been an uptick in cases in Montgomery, in Birmingham, and in Mobile, as well as uh, different parts of Georgia and Memphis. Um, I say all that to say that as we start uh, releasing social distance and we start coming back, uh, we have to do that very strategically and very carefully, um, which is why I'm not giving you a date. I'm just telling you here are some resources. Part of it is on how we also communicate this with our members. Uh, so Pastor Jeanette, would you uh, speak a bit to uh, communication practices? Yes. Uh, first of all, just putting up once again our Synod website and the Youth and Young Adult website. Um, yeah, keeping in mind, as uh, Pastor Trapp already mentioned and Bishop as well, that um, I, I'd say for well over a decade now, it's been important to be online. Um, it's important because that is sort of the, uh, the front door of your church, if you will. When folks w are going to venture out into a place or a space where they can worship and gather with others uh, in, in a faith community, uh, they're going to look it up online nine out of ten times, maybe maybe 99 out of 100. Um, so it is the front door of your church. And so uh, maintaining some kind of presence online is going to be very important uh, for the community, for your outreach. Um, I will share with you that it, it's been, uh, it has been overwhelming, I'm sure, for those of you who communicate, are communicators in your churches, to disseminate all this information. So we're doing our best to help collate this on our websites. That's why I wanted to share that. Uh, the other thing I'm gonna share real quick, uh, quickly is our social, uh, yes. Michael, I don't know if it's your microphone or something, but I, we're having a real hard time hearing you. Okay. So if you could just speak up some, that would be helpful. All right, is that a little better? That is so much better, thank you. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so. Basically, I just said be online. <laughs> um, can sum up the, that last little bit. Um, and then also wanted to share with you, uh, social media is going to be another opportunity for you to either hear from us um, or for you to encourage you to utilize your own social media to communicate with your folks. Um, as Pastor Trapp mentioned, it's going to be really important as you enter into uh, different phases that you communicate this well, including signage in your church, um, uh, making sure you put in place some kind of opportunity, make sure you put in some kind of uh, space for your folks to um, make sure that you have email lists set up, make sure you have phone trees set up, whatever works best for you. Uh, to put that in place now um, as quickly as you can, uh, because when anything else comes up, uh, you're going to need to utilize those communication lists. So that's a major part of disaster response. Uh, it also shows that you are going to be taking steps to care for your members. So please, please um, take that to con into consideration as you move forward is, is what types of communication lists you have established already. Um, be flexible, um, have your plans in place, but be flexible. And also, um, just another encouragement for you to subscribe. One of the things that we're trying to do as a synod is to support you by providing resources and guidelines and documentation. Uh, again, questions can come to me if you have communications. I'll put my email address in here uh, for you to uh, reach out to me for best practices. 
and uh, for other ways to learn how to communicate. Uh, real basic, real free website and, uh, and Facebook are some of the best ways to communicate, uh, but please have some, some distribution lists ready as well, whether that's a phone tree or an email list. Uh, any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. As a note uh, to everyone, we've been doing this as a Synod staff since the beginning of March, uh, but there are sermons available uh, on the Synod website by YouTube video and print form. Those are also translated into Spanish, and there's also a 1-800 number, or telephone number, excuse me, that we have uh, created for you all. Uh, you can dial one or dial two or whatever uh, for those sermons, and those are also in English and Spanish. Um, those are on our website, and Pastor Michael can put the link uh, to that phone number and uh, those sermons while I'm speaking. Um, but uh, we do that not to take the place of your pastors, uh, but to give your pastors a break. Uh, it's, it's double the effort to create all this online worship, uh, as well as for your musicians uh, and deacons in your places. So this is uh, our small attempt to try to offer a little bit of care for your rostered ministers. Uh, during this time. So please check that out. We'll continue doing that. Uh, as a note for that, this coming Sunday, um, I have a sermon available for Pentecost Sunday. Um, and then the worship team of the Senate is putting together a vigil of Pentecost service, which is the Saturday night before. Um, so we encourage you to wear red on all those um, worship screens, take pictures of yourselves, uh, tag the Southeastern Synod on Facebook so we can see the Pentecost colors all over the Synod. Uh, but those worship opportunities will continue to happen. On June 7th, uh, Presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton has uh, recorded a Trinity Sunday sermon for the whole church, and that has just been made available today, and so those resources are out. Um, a preliminary announcement was on our Facebook about that. Pastor Jeanette will also make sure that gets in our e-news that will go out next week for all of you to know how to download that video and, and put it into your worship uh, resources. So I wanted you to know about that. Um, I also to let you know, I mentioned this a little earlier, but I did call the Mental Health Task Force together. Those resources, uh, some are available at the very back of the uh, uh, COVID-19 Synod resources. One of the things we're also working on is how to provide respite care for rostered ministers, uh, in the midst of this pandemic and then after this, uh, as well as their, uh, how do you care for youth and children who are dealing with this? Um, and then next week, uh, the team and I will be working on how to also provide elder care. So we're gonna be doing webinars uh, and conversations for uh, senior members of our congregations and how are they taking care of themselves mentally and physically and emotionally uh, in the midst of this, and what are ways that congregations can reach out uh, to help with that. So be on the lookout for those uh, things to come. One of the other pieces about this is we know uh, that helping people with their stewardship uh, and financial resourcing is also incredibly important. Um, and so Pastor Karen Boda would like to spend a little bit of time talking with you about the grant opportunities from the ELCA and our Synod. Thank you, Bishop. Um, yeah, we give God thanks for the ministry that you are doing in each of your contexts. Incredible. And we also know that many of you have been hit financially by the virus. And so um, one of the biggest joys that we get is to make some grants available to you as congregations and also rostered ministers in the Synod. Um, the first grant was a, a COVID-19 grant from the Synod, and it was um, funded through um, holy closures of generous congregations in addition to some monies from the ELCA. And this past week, um, actually the checks went in the mail yesterday, we were able to distribute almost $40,000, $40,000 worth of aid to 14 congregations in the Synod, um, 12 of which were multicultural ministries. So um, just really give God thanks that we were able to do that with the support of um, the ELCA as well as the um, the holy closures. Um, applications can still come in for that available on the website. Um, the second grant that's available is a food insecurity grant, which has been made possible through Lutheran Disaster Relief. 15 congregations in our synod um, will be able to receive grants um, in an initial amount of $500 and can be replenished up to $3,000 
um, to help support the feeding ministries, um, the food ministries within those congregations. And those can be ministries that are either done directly by the congregations or through community partners. Um, so again, another great opportunity to support um, the, the local community in which you exist. Um, information's available on the Synod website for that. And then finally, um, hopefully you have heard of this, but if not, um, check into what's called the Lifeline Fund. These are two grants that are available. First grant is uh, both are funded by the Lilly Foundation. And the first grant is available to assist with education debt of our rostered ministers. Um, if you don't know whether your pastor or your deacon has educational debt, um, ask them. And if they have it, have them check into the Lifeline Fund. Um, this will provide not only some monetary assistance, but it will also provide um, access to financial education and a financial planner. Um, the second part of that is um, stewardship education for your congregations. These programs will teach pastors and also congregation leaders how to design and carry forward stewardship programs, um, year-round programs in your congregation. Um, it's, a, it's a resource that is available to you, um, and we strongly encourage you to take advantage of it um, always, but now especially with the virus and some of the financial situations our congregations are in. So um, check it out on the Synod website. Um, also, Michael, if you want to stick my name in there, um, I am happy to field questions or interests um, in those programs. So thanks. Thank you so much, Pastor uh, Boder, for all that good work. And uh, we're grateful for uh, the strategic initiatives of the Synod that allow us to do that, as well as uh, grant money from the ELCA. Uh, at this time, I'd like to see uh, what questions uh, you all have. So one of the ways we'll do that is in the chat box, uh, either put your name first and last and I'll call on you or uh, you can write your question in the chat box. Uh, but we'll go ahead and take questions now. Or unmute mute yourself and uh, we'll see if that works too. But with 65 of you, it might be hard to do that. Questions, concerns, or comments from folks, if you would put your name in the chat box or write your question there or unmute yourself quickly and we'll go ahead and call on you. Jonathan and Bishop both said we are not in phase one. Please explain uh, Bill Grable. Jonathan, why don't you uh, go ahead and take that and then I can uh, add on to that. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the, the reason that I said that is because the way that the both the document that the Senate has put out as well as the federal guidelines for phasing transition um, <clears throat> talks about a, a 14 day steady decline in, in cases while still maintaining um, a high level of, of testing. And we're, we're, as the bishop mentioned, we are not seeing that right now um, in, <clears throat> in our synod. So I think that, uh, that that's the reason that I, that I say that. It's hard to say overall for each of our states. Obviously, there may be counties within each of our states that are seeing that kind of a decline, but that also speaks to some of the challenges of trying to create policy that is uh, or guideline or cre yeah, create directions that would in include everyone. So, but overall, I don't see our, our, any of our states in the Senate in phase one. Yeah, and just to add quickly uh, to that, there, that doesn't mean that there aren't uh, specific cities or even counties that might be that. Um, so again, it is it has got to be contextual. Uh, but overall, which is the comment that both Pastor Trapp and I are making overall, uh, the four states are not well in, inundated into phase one as defined by the CDC. I think that's fair, right, Pastor Trapp? Absolutely. Uh, the other kind of follow-up to that, and then we'll get to Janet Preston's question. Uh, Jesse, uh, which like in, any good student who comes prepared for class says, I promise I read the whole guide, but Pastor Jonathan, could you quickly touch on the kinds of metrics Will want to use to make these phase decisions? That is, that is a great question. Um, 
And the guide talks about wanting to look through, or not just fixate on a single data point, but look for trends in the data. And the, uh, the video that Pastor Henning and I put together uh, references some of the resources for that each of the state health departments are putting together. They all have um, really good dashboards where you can see by the county level what the trend is in your area. Um, and if you're a congregation that draws from multiple counties, then you can kind of look at that overall. Um, from a, a, a third party perspective, uh, I've personally have been looking at a website called statnews.com that pulls a lot of their information from Johns Hopkins University, but again, can drill down to that county level and show uh, changes in uh, trend over time. Thank you. Uh, quickly for Janet Preston, um, I'm gonna let Pastor Michael Jeanette answer that. Are there any uh, prepared materials to help our children and youth better adapt to the current environment? Uh, I, I don't have any particular uh, resources, but I would say we are going to follow the CDC guidelines, and that's kind of what I've been encouraging uh, congregational members who have asked me that directly. So we keep pointing back to that, and, and we do have that material online now uh, to point to folks. But I think, and Janet, I, you can unmute yourself and speak to this if you like, but I think if I read your, quest, your qu question, it's not just uh, how do they prepare for the logistical ways of getting back into church, and being physically and separately apart. I think I, if I hear you right, okay. uh, faith formation resources, is that correct, Jane? Right, exactly. I mean, we have so many young children and um, youth and even adults with disabilities who are struggling with this environment and trying to figure out, okay, how, how do we help them adapt? Um, yeah, how do we, sure. uh, as a church, reach out to them and and uh, help them to, f to feel Christ? That's a great question. Uh, Pastor Jeanette, go ahead. Yeah, we um, we have collated some resources online uh, on our Synod Youth and Young Adult page um, to help address some of that. Um, trying to pull the link up real quick, but the ELCA does have some uh, uh, faith formation resources. Uh, what I have found most helpful is connecting with um, uh, some of the Facebook groups. Uh, and, and you're welcome to join them, the ELCA Youth Ministry Network and ELCA Youth page uh, on Facebook. Uh, there tends to be some, some good material coming there. Uh, it's a lot of shared information, a lot of shared resources from various churches and synods. Um, this page here, uh, about to send out to everybody in the chat box, this is a, a resource curated by ELCA uh, folks, and it points to a lot of youth and children's ministry materials and it's not just not just uh, material in a standard form. It's how do we adapt to this environment? So I apologize for missing the question uh, and misunderstanding, but um, but there are, uh, that that's a good start. There you can also go to um, uh, our Synod Youth and Young Adult page, and uh, I will be pointing out to um, I'll, and when I wrap up here, I'll, I'll get the, a better link to you uh, from our Youth and Young Adult page as well. Is that helpful? Is that that's a, that's a good place to start is that, that link that I sent. No, that's great. It, it, but it's also another layer that the, some of these, uh, that we need to face as a congregation. Yeah. Um, and that's something I think that, that many of our congregations are blessed to have really strong youth and um, family ministries. Yet we still, um, I think we, we still could use, come together as a group to come up and develop more resources, right? Yeah. Janet, if it would be helpful, one of the things that we could do, in addition to what's already out there in print, if you think it would be helpful, and uh, Pastor Jeanette, I think we could easily put this together, is to try to find some of our resource folks, uh, like Rachel Alley and Savannah Sullivan and Molly Beckdeen and those folks from the ELCA, um, who might be willing to do uh, something like this that's more specific to just youth and children. I know uh, Mary Halkett, uh, Lutheran Church of the Redeemer, is also a great resource for our synod that we call on quite often. So, Janet, if that's uh, a helpful thing, I think I'll, I'll encourage Pastor Jeanette to look at what it might mean to schedule something more specific yeah. just to that age group. Which I, is, I think that would be great because, you know, we are as adults faced with this uncertainty, but yeah. helping our youth and children grapple with it on a long-term basis, I think that's really where we are. 
yeah, I think we're more than happy to, to do that. We're doing that with our elder adults, which I just spoke to. So I think uh, not to miss that demographic would be really important. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, I, Lynette, I'm not quite sure. Our meetings will be weekly on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Same Zoom line. I'm not sure what that means. Um, are the steward programs mentioned by Pastor Boda part of the Lifeline Fund or standalone resources? Uh, Pastor Boda? I got that when I answered it lower in the chat. Why don't you say it out loud just for people who aren't able to see the chat? Um, there's stewardship information available at the link that I just provided. Um, it's in the last e-newsletter, and there's a link to that on the main page. There's three different grants that I talked about. One is the Synod COVID-19 grant. The second is the Food Insecurity grant. And the third is the Lifeline Funds, which is both education grant as well as um, stewardship assistance for congregations. Um, maybe the easiest thing, read it, and then um, give me a shout, and I'll be happy to, to talk about it. And where people might not be encouraged to sing, you can hear that dogs are encouraged. Sorry, no, no, I can, <laughs> I'm going to run, take care of her. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, the, do we have specific resources about singing to share with others? If you look in the guidelines we put out from the Synod's COVID uh, document, there are uh, uh, links there and information about singing. After June 8th, I'll have more to share with you um, from the ecumenical document that I was talking about that is more specific um, about singing in choirs and instruments and all that type of thing. The reality is uh, part of the reason why there's not something specific like right this very minute is because it's changing weekly and even daily. Um, and so we're gonna try to keep that as updated as possible, but, but stay, stay tuned for that. Um, also would like to know about publishing CDC guidelines or studies, we can point to see and just answer that. Uh, oh, the congregation's checking temperatures as people enter the church. That is, um, that's, that's a tough, that's a tough knot there. And so Pastor Trapp, why don't you start with that answer and then I'll, I'll take it from there. And I apologize, I was distracted by my son briefly. Could you ask the question one more time? It's okay, should, should we as congregations be checking temperatures of congregants as they enter the church? Um, I think as, uh, as, as Pastor Henning said, if, if you are doing that, then making sure you're using the, the no touch, uh, thermometers, I think it, ultimately that will come down to, to your context and the decisions that you make. One of the challenges that, that I, this is me speaking personally, that I personally find with that is that because we do seem to have so much asymptomatic spread, um, it's, it's, it would be good to know if someone was sick because you definitely would want to encourage them to either seek medical treatment or to, to not come in, but further, I think it's, it's perhaps better to even have folks check their temperatures at home before they, they would even come in. Um, that way there's no risk that they could spread, not just COVID-19, but if they had the flu, if they had some other illness. Um, I would I would recommend that before I would start a, a temperature check station. Thank you, Pastor. A um, couple more things here. Let's see. Uh, oh, I uh, would like to know, the, let's see, Wilma says, what are the problems mentioned in last week's meeting concerning the use of pre-filled communion kits? Um, Wilma, I feel like I've had about 500 meetings since last week, so I'm not totally sure what I said last week the the um and i wrote later in the chat box the concern with the pre-filled communion kits is about distribution um how are you going to distribute them so that there's not cross contamination right. also then how will you um pick up the trash afterwards to make sure that you know because they they're wrapped so there's a lot of um wrapping that can into that. Uh, and so how does that get taken care of? So again, you're not having that cross-contamination issue. Um, and so the bishop, if you want to talk just about what wafer, you know, wafers just are a more economical and environmental way of still being able to do communion. Yeah, uh, the communion thing is still tricky. And part of that ecumenical guidelines, they're going to be putting out uh, ways that, in which you can do this. And there are communities across the church that are trying this out in a variety of forms. Um, the wafer thing is is better in the sense that one person's hands aren't pulling from one loaf of bread, which is my typical practice and what I would prefer. Uh, but it makes it more sanitary that 
the wafers are spread about and um, either tongs are used to place them in someone's hands uh, or they're spread about enough to where uh, uh, there's no touching by either hand. Um, it just makes it a little bit more sanitary for that. The wine piece is a bit more hard uh, to, to, to tackle. Um, and if you looked at the guidelines that you'll see us sent out and what we put in ours, um, common cup and intention are problematic, as you can imagine, just for the amounts of, of uh, aerosol that's coming from your mouth from the person ahead of you that would be touching that, which is why um, we believe as Lutheran Christians that Jesus Christ is present in with and under one element alone. So if you're only able to offer the bread, uh, that is more than sufficient for communion. And by bread, uh, whether it's individual uh, prepackaged something or if it's the uh, individual loaves for each person or wafers or what have you, uh, don't do anything that's, that's not bread. Don't do anything that's not wine or grape juice. Don't get into the, the habit of Oreos and milk or Cheetos and and anything like that, that just makes every hair on my head stand up and I don't have many of those. So uh, we wanna make sure we don't do anything that, that you know, uh, takes away from the Eucharist. Uh, there are ways to do that and it speaks to that in some of our guidelines. We'll be offering more guidance to that. I do know there are some churches who are trying different things. Um, as far as people bringing their own bread and wine, uh, but then you have to have the question of is an open container you're driving with and what happens with visitors who are coming in and do you have prepackaged sanitary bread for them? Uh, these are areas that we've never had to live in. And so where I may sound like I don't know what I'm talking about, it's because for some of the stuff, I don't know what I'm talking about. And one of the best things you can do as a leader in the church is when you don't know something, don't make it up. Uh, and so we're learning as we go. Um, and what I think could be most helpful for people is that because we don't know all the scientific facts of this, until we know it, that's even more reason not to rush into it. And more reason as we phase back in, um, maybe the first Sunday we're back, communion isn't offered. Uh, maybe we phase back in enough to figure it all out. Uh, but we're gonna be offering those guidelines and guidances as, as, as well as we can. Um, concerning signage, does the Senate have a poster with the five core actions? Uh, we do not have a poster, um, but if anyone on this call has um, a, uh, a gift for quickly creating something. I feel quite sure Pastor Jeanette would be more than happy to receive that. Uh, otherwise, I think it, we, what we could do is we could create something that could be downloadable uh, and you could print it off in your own churches. I think that could be uh, easy enough to do. Uh, Pastor Jeanette, let's put that on our, our list of things that we can do. Um, Michael added the uh, ministry links about youth ministry. Um, Pastor Jonathan, this comes from Barbara. Can you speak to the concerns about restrooms and our church's lack of toilet lids, the hand blower dryers, the relative risk of spreading viruses, and should we consider modifying um, those? Yes, and I, I was, <clears throat> again, there is a lot of uh, good guidance on cleaning and disinfecting on the CDC website that I would recommend that I believe is linked to in the guide. So there's, you can quickly get to that. Um, I think it, it's, it's going to change depending on what, what your facilities look like for each congregation. Um, <clears throat> so you, if you have multi-stall facilities, you may need to consider limiting the access to the, the number of people who could be in there, um, looking at what cleaning would look like in between. Uh, but again, that, that's going to vary depending on on your congregation um, but it, it it is maybe an opportunity to to rethink the way that things are currently done one of the things that has been offered up by um, a couple of epidemiologists who have led some of these uh, webinars um, for instance water fountains in churches um, you shouldn't be using uh, the other thing is if your church has been vacant, and we've said this the last time, but it's worth repeating, if you've not been using your building, you need to make sure that someone's flushing your toilets and turning on the faucets at least once a week uh, to make sure that bacteria doesn't grow uh, in the pipes. Um, but water fountains are not uh, advisable. If you look at the guidelines that were put out there, and there's more even on the CDC website as far as even how you, you think about food handling, uh, because we are people who enjoy our coffee and love our fellowship hours. Uh, so you have to even think through those things. 
Um, people grabbing food out of a bowl is not going to be advisable. Using uh, sanitary tongs and that type of thing or pre-plated uh, food is the best way to, uh, to go. So people just grab what they're going to eat and then throw it away. Uh, the other thing is often forgotten areas of the church or things you're going to really want to think through as you phase back in. Uh, so not just the bathrooms, but nurseries. Uh, and uh, office structures which don't get as much attention. And even like I said last time, how you think about uh, bulletins and hymnals and uh, those types of things. Are there other questions or, or comments? I posted one recently from Don. It says, um, are there any plans for the ELCA to reach out to ALCM and other music organizations to encourage those organizations to move quickly in developing support for cantors and or church musicians? As a music director, I'm struggling with knowing where to begin square one. Yeah, that's a great question, Don. Um, quick answer to that is I know ALCM is already having that conversation. Uh, I'm also uh, in some small circles with uh, the choral directors and choral societies of the United States who are all having uh, these same conversations. Um, what, I, what I know is that the ALCM group is working on, uh, through the guidance of CDC and World Health Organization and musicians, not just singing, but playing instruments and how to offer some guidance uh, for that. The last I checked in with them, they were still working on that. And I've not seen uh, anything uh, specific uh, from them about that. But, um, I will be sure to reach out to the ELC worship office and ask if there's anything more specific about that. Um, and if you find anything before I do, share it with me, please. Um, Mary asked about liability. Um, Mary, the uh, biggest thing you're going to have to do is, the, as Pastor Jill said, check your congregation's insurance plan, uh, and even more so, call the actual agent. Uh, it's not just because the insurance plan isn't going to mention global pandemic in it. Um, that's not written in the writer, and they didn't think about that when they wrote your insurance plan. Um, but now they will. Um, so you need to call Church Mutual or uh, whoever you have your, your church insurance with. I will tell you that there have been a number of um, churches, not just Lutheran, but across the board denominations, uh, whose insurances, I'm, I'm aware of one in Florida specifically, who told the pastor uh, if your congregation gathers back and there aren't safety precautions, uh, you're putting yourself at an insurance liability risk, um, especially if they don't wear the mask and socially distance and that type of thing. Also, remember, each state is different with the laws that are in that state. So all of that has to be thought out. Have you seen protocols about doing online sessions, Zoom, and proper use of music to make sure that we have permission to use online? Um, so Sunnies and Seasons has, uh, through Augsburg Fortress, has uh, extended their uh, licensing through the end of Ju uh, June, Pastor Michael, um, and we can share that with you uh, here and as a follow-up email for you, uh, but that they've included that. Uh, Lori Ann, how should churches handle contact tracing or should we? Um, Pastor Trapp and uh, Pastor Henning, you may want to speak to this by what was given guidance from Dr. Erica Bjornstad. Uh, Pastor Henning, do you want to say something about that? Yes, and, um, and I've been on a couple uh, training sessions with FEMA. Um, if, there ten, if, they, if there is an outbreak in your area and that person is a part of your congregation, public health is going to ask you who was also present so that they can contact them. So it's really helpful for you to have a mechanism in order to keep track of who is present um, in your congregation at worship. Uh, whether that is a digital um, uh, attendance check-in, um, some congregations are developing uh, QR codes that you can just take a picture with your phone and be able to log in and email that you were present or a Facebook uh, event where you uh, you say you're coming um, so that they can uh, reach out and be able to determine how close you were to that per particular person. So um, it's not a requirement. It's just going to be good practice for you to know who is there uh, in case uh, there is a case of someone who was asymptomatic during the worship service. Thank you. And uh, David Beecher, Don Harris, and other musicians who are on this call, if you find out any more information than what we've shared, 
um, regarding singing um, or mu uh, how to play musical instruments in this time. Uh, I would be grateful for you to send me whatever you uh, receive, even if you think I've already gotten it, send it to me again. Be happy to, to receive that. Uh, David Beecher did share in the chat box, for those of you who aren't seeing the chat, uh, that the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians uh, will release a video featuring 1,300 plus uh, Lutheran musicians doing an arrangement of O Day Full of Grace. Many even on this Zoom were part of that. Uh, you can go to alcm.org uh, to see that and you can include that uh, in your Pentecost worship for this coming uh, Sunday. Um, other, any other questions or comments? Uh, we're about at our time. Just as a quick uh, guesstimation on where you are with things, in about a month or so, when there's a lot more information from CDC and, and other folks, um, and we have even more specifics to share, and some of you will have been in phase one or something, uh, would, would it be helpful to do something like this again? If so, just nod, do your thumbs up on the reaction button or whatever. I'm getting lots of yeses, so I'm gonna assume that means you want that again, okay. So we will schedule something in about uh, a month or so um, with some more guidelines and guidance and even try to see if there's some other voices that we need to have in this conversation that just aren't the ones who have spoken. I'm really grateful for Pastor Trapp uh, for using that bivocational hat uh, tonight um, and appreciate that. Just a couple of notes on some upcoming things. Uh, Pastor Mike, do you want to uh, speak quickly about uh, the eFirm gathering that's happening? Yes, we'll be publishing at the end of this week, early next week. June 13th will be our uh, Synod Youth Gathering. Uh, we usually gather for five days in June and uh, to not to replace the in-person gathering, but to allow a touch point for our folks to gather together. We're going to break into small groups for about an hour. Uh, we'll have a time of worship and a time of uh, sort of silly videos, uh, something that our folks hold dear is a little bit of a talent show. So we'll have that on June 13th and on June 20th, our CESLIO, which is our youth leadership team, will be gathering to elect new members and uh, to gather to touch base about leadership in our, in our uh, youth leadership in our synod. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Henning, do you want to speak uh, quickly about October 17th, Fall Faith Formation Day? Yes. Um, as many of you know, our uh, Senate Assembly had to be canceled due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so we are hoping on October 17th to have a Faith Formation Day for our Senate. The hope is that we can get more people that wouldn't normally be able to travel uh, to uh, Assembly to join um, in about seven or eight different locations across our Senate. Uh, for a day of um, uh, education, learning, conversation, um, and uh, worship. And so uh, we were, will hopefully be able to Zoom um, a keynote speaker, a Bible study leader, the bishop to all the locations, um, and then have opportunities for uh, people in those local congregations to have workshops that are specific uh, to that location, uh, as well as lunch and and a uh, worship service. Um, so more information will come about that as we uh, get further into the summer and, um, and can look at what that looks like. Uh, so that is coming. Yeah, thank you. Um, those of you who are familiar with Novus Way Ministries, just to point out if you haven't already heard, Luther Ridge, Luther Rock, Luther Ranch, Luther Springs uh, has canceled summer camp, unfortunately, for the summer due to COVID-19. Um, the full press release and information about that is at novusway.org, N-O-V-U-S-W-A-Y.org. Um, and information that I put out today is on our Facebook page on the Synod. Uh, um, what they're encouraging you to do is if you have the financial means to do so, and you're not needing a refund for you or your, your children, uh, to think about donating that to Novus Way um, so that it could help with year-round staff as well as to be put into an opportunity fund uh, for camp to happen in the following year. Uh, so be on the lookout for ways that we as a synod can even invest uh, in that. Um, just very lastly, just wanted to say last week, um, I held a Zoom uh, for the whole ELCA 
on building up the body of Christ where all bodies are valued, a look at the ELCA's condemnation about white supremacy. Um, and we had uh, over 500 people join us for that. That uh, is recorded and on our YouTube channel that Pastor Michael has put uh, in the chat box. It's also uh, on our Facebook and website. So encourage you to use that as a tool in your own congregations. Obviously we had the conversation last week and uh, even within the week, there have been uh, more uh, racially motivated attacks and murders that have happened in our country. And those are just the ones that make the news. So we have much work to do as a church and as a people. And I encourage you in your witness as leaders in your congregation to join me in that uh, fight. Um, lastly, I'd just like to call on Pastor Karen Boda to close us with a prayer and to say thank you so much to each of you for all you do in your congregations and for helping us as a synod uh, for being the body of Christ that God has called us to be. So Pastor Boda, if you would. Lord be with you. And also with you. Dear and gracious Lord, for all who have contracted coronavirus, we pray for care and healing. For those who are particularly vulnerable, we pray for safety and protection. For all who experience fear or anxiety, we pray for peace of mind and spirit. For all facing difficult decisions between food on the table or public safety, we pray for policies that recognize their plight. For those who do not have adequate health insurance, we pray that no family will face financial burdens alone. For those who are afraid to access care due to immigration status, we pray for recognition of the God-given dignity of all. For our brothers and sisters around the world, we pray for shared solidarity. For public officials and decision makers, we pray for wisdom and guidance. Gracious God, during this time, may your church, may we be a sign of hope, comfort, and love to all. Grant peace, grant comfort, grant healing, grant your presence. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you all. Good night.